Hey everyone, welcome back to Seeker Plus today. I am Trace and this is episode three of three in our series about nuclear science. Subscribe, make sure you get all the episodes in the series. If you haven't watched the first two parts, make sure you go back and watch those before you get to this one. You can also check out the audio version of these podcasts on SoundCloud and iTunes, but moving on. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about radiation. We're gonna talk about nuclear energy. We're gonna talk about spacecrafts that run on nukes. Yeah, they've launched nukes into space. We're also gonna talk about how nuclear is the future. But first, let's try a little something new. Let's kick into it. Atomic cities, cities near atomic plants, are pleasant places of comfortable and well-built family homes. With the ever-increasing use of nuclear energy, more towns may eventually become atomic cities. Cities near safe and efficient atomic plants. You can actually find that whole video, Magic of the Atom, the Atomic City, on the Prelinger archives, and uh, it's awesome. <laughs> and you should watch the whole thing, it's great. Um, it's like in the Beyonce of internet history archive.org, easy to find. So nuclear power is the future. There are a handful of plants that have melted down, so most people think, no, nuclear power, we don't want that, it's, it's in the past. It's contaminated large areas of the planet, and it's become clear that maybe we're not quite ready for it yet. And thus, again, it will be the future. Because the problem isn't nuclear. The problem isn't even nuclear material. The problem is the radiation that's caused by fission, because fission is a dirty power. Luckily, last week we had Diana from Physics Girl in to talk about it, so I asked her specifically about radiation. Check it out. Radiation has essentially three types, right? Mm. Alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, or is that just too simple? The I would say that's too simple. Okay. Um, I, I th I like to think of radiation broken up into ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. Scientists love to categorize things. Mm -hmm, totally. <laughs> that's just one way to categorize them. Um, I actually love talking about radiation because it's one of the first things that I got to talk to my parents about once I passed that line, that level of knowing more than them about science. Oh, man. <laughs> and, and the thing that I learned that I was so excited to share with them was that um, electromagnetic radiation, which is basically just light, um, is is all the same thing, just different levels of energy. So that includes that includes microwaves, that includes radio waves, visible light, and then on up into those more dangerous ionizing types of radiation like gamma rays or X-rays, um, and even infrared, ultraviolet. That's all in there, just not ionizing. So types of radiation uh, that we typically think of are ionizing radiation. When when people say radiation, they often mean ionizing, ionizing radiation. radiation. Yeah, because technically, you know, visible light coming off of a light bulb is radiation. It's electromagnetic radiation. It's just not ionizing. Um, so, so I think a lot of the fear of the word radiation comes from uh, from not knowing what it is. It comes from just a lack of knowledge. So, so types of radiation, uh, we've got alpha particles that you were mentioning. That's basically just two neutrons and two protons. It's, yeah. it's like, it's essentially like, the nucleus of a helium atom. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, but it has a lot of energy typically because when you break down something like uranium and you shoot out a helium nucleus, you got to have a whole lot of energy to be able to get an entire type of element to escape from the nucleus of another element. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then and then beta particles are really, really high energy electrons or actually positrons as well, mm -hmm. which are the antimatter of yeah, the yeah. electrons. Oh, I love antimatter. <laughs> and then gamma rays are a type of electromagnetic radiation like we were talking about. Got it. Yeah. And so when it comes to radioactive elements, the most radioactive element is polonium-210. Yeah, yeah, d debatably, but, but it seems like that one's the most likely to spontaneously decay. Okay, and it glows blue? Is that cool? Yeah, Is that true? you know, I wouldn't say that it glows blue. I've heard this, um, but but I think what's actually happening is that um, the radiation coming off of polonium polonium two ten hard to say, um, is actually ionizing the air around yeah. the element. Yeah, so it's stripping off electrons. Like we said, ionizing radiation. Right. It's stripping off electrons, and that's making the air around it glow. Yeah. So technically, the aura of polonium two ten is glowing. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know you were into astrology. That's cool. <laughs> Only for this one sentence. That's right now. Yeah, and so it releases alpha particles, um, which you can get a dangerous dose of radiation from polonium, according to um, the University of Georgia's uh, Cham Dallas 
in a, quote, microgram, smaller than a single speck of pepper. That's how radioactive it is. Yeah, yeah. it's very radioactive. That's an incredibly small amount of material. Of material. Yeah. The thing is, but though... think how many atoms are in that... There's lots. A lot. I, I mean, wouldn't know what I order wouldn't of magnitude. I wouldn't even know, yeah. How <laughs> trillions, to, trillions. Right. Oh, my many. gosh. Yeah, uh, there's a fair number of, of <laughs> atoms. But when it comes to this, though, the thing that I think people never talk about, and I would love to get your take on, is dosage. Because, mm. like, in dosage is really where radiation sinks. You know, if you have too little dosage to hurt you, then it's mostly fine. For example, bananas. Mm -hmm. Potassium is radioactive. Mm -hmm. It's a, it, it breaks down and decays. So if you put a Geiger counter next to a banana, it'll like go crazy if you have it on the right settings. Fiesta ware, colorful dishes from the 20th century. They had a glaze on them that had uranium oxide in it. Mm -hmm. And that was also radioactive. But unlike bananas, you could get a high enough dosage mm -hmm. of radiation from Fiesta ware if you used it for long periods of time. Right. Yeah. Dosage is incredibly important. I think, um, you know, cancer patients would know that dosage is really important because when you're getting irradiated in order to target something like a tumor, um, you're you're not getting enough radiation to be harmful to you, your entire body, but enough to hopefully kill the tumor. Mm -hmm. So that's when dosage, dosage of radiation really comes into play. Um, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I went to Los Alamos National Lab when I was an undergrad doing research. We were working on a, a particle detector, and we had to wear those dose meters yeah. around the entire um, the entire campus uh, because there have been and there there will always be some radioactive materials there. And the dosage meter just tells you how much radiation you're getting, and it's not like like if you're getting any, oh no, like you you're goner. It's more just like you want to check how much you're getting because just living in everyday life is going to give you a little bit of radiation, a small small dosage. But um, when you go to a place like the Los Alamos National Labs where the nuclear bomb was developed, um, you want to make sure that you're not getting above that critical dosage that could potentially be harmful. Right. Yeah. I mean, you've even probably read, if you've been around the radiation space, that pilots get exposed to more radiation mm. just right. coming out of like space and being closer to the edge of the atmosphere. Right. Not a lot closer. I right. mean, relatively speaking, it's not that much closer than we are, but it's close enough that there's so much more atmosphere between us and them. Yeah. And the atmosphere... And yeah, and the atmosphere blocks radiation. Mm -hmm. It's just a bunch of gas. <laughs> it yeah. looks like an invisible thin layer, but it's blocking a lot of radiation, a lot of um, cosmic rays, they're called, from space that are dangerous and are ionizing. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I was looking through all sorts of different things that had radiation in them. We have a video about radium and how they used to put that in a lot of stuff, mm. so I won't touch on that so much. <laughs> but um, That stuff is crazy. It is super crazy. They actually put uranium in dentures. Did you know this? I didn't know that. Yeah, so I found this old... <laughs> paper that was done uh, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the U.S., and they used fluorescent quality in uranium to give fake teeth the natural appearance of real teeth, because, no you know, kidding. like, they have that, like, real, real teeth have that, like, glow or that, like, kind of fluorescent yeah. <laughs> feel, I guess, and they were like, oh, well, we can do that. Just put some uranium in there. So, then so they put it, it in their for, mouth. That's crazy. Yeah. So it was actually for, uh, for like, aesthetic appeal. Yeah, aesthetic <laughs> appeal. Beauty is a B word, for sure. Uh, 1977, they said in this paper, approximately 40 million porcelain teeth were distributed, mm. and many of those had uranium in it. Who knew? That's, I mean, I didn't know that for sure. They also had lenses that were made, uh, the glass was made of silica, the coating was zinc oxide, and thorium and uranium are natural contaminants of both silica and zinc. I see. Meaning alpha particles could have been emitted from glass lenses yeah. for, like, correcting vision. <laughs> cool. So anything else, last thoughts on radiation? Yeah, I think I think radiation is uh, is a bit of a mystery to people, but um, but the more you learn about it, I think the more it just becomes a fascinating topic. So radiation is a big deal, but there are a lot of examples of how to use nuclear energy without triggering all of this fission and radiation and all sorts of other problems. For example, nuclear powered spaceships. NASA has a crazy plan. And I have to say, I love NASA's crazy plans. They're the best. We cover them all the time on the regular show. But this one is particularly crazy and has a great name, Kilo Power. Not like kill, it's like Kilo Power. It's a fusion-powered spacecraft. 
Isn't that awesome? So cool. It uses engines that were designed in 1816, but it puts them into space. Essentially, it's called the Stirling engine. They're now used in yachts and submarines, mostly for auxiliary power, but they harvest heat and funnel it into pistons. The pistons convert the heat into mechanical energy, that's converted into electricity, and any excess heat can be radiated into space. You can create energy from something like nuclear decay or uranium fission or from fusion to power spacecrafts. So cool. On Twitter, at KingSkyette asked us about the fusion in spaceships. Thanks for that question. I agree, fusion in spaceships would be awesome, uh, but we have to actually figure fusion out first, because right now we can create fusion, but we have trouble making it into a sustained reaction. See, when it comes to fusion, essentially we're taking two hydrogen atoms and we're smushing them together. To do that, you need a lot of energy. At the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory here in the Bay Area at the National Ignition Facility, they are doing fusion. They're smushing these things together all the time. They're doing it multiple times a day. It's actually pretty easy. The thing is, they can't do it repeatedly. They can't do it over and over in a sustainable way. Because right now, the way we've designed our fission plants, you have a little target, and that target has to be built every time, and they can't just drop a new target in, they have to go in and reset everything up. So if we can figure out how to drop the targets and build them on mass so that we can have them in the exact spot that the lasers hit all at the same time perfectly and work out all that timing, then we could maybe have fusion. But we're just not there yet. We're working on it. Nuclear technology might feel stagnant, but I think this might help illustrate that it's still advancing. Everyone knows that ships and submarines use nuclear technology. Nuclear submarines have been around for a long time, and so have nuclear ships. In fact, there are over 140 ships powered by nuclear just roaming around the planet. Uh, they're powering more than 180 small nuclear reactors, and they've had 12,000 reactor years of marine operation since the 1950s. They were first launched in 1955. Uh, nuclear submarines are a mainstay of young boys' obsession with the military. You know, the, the big submarine coming out of the water and splashing everywhere, it's awesome. And the nuclear engines on those submarines were a revelation once they were put on there because it allowed the submarine to not have to resurface to get fuel, right? So instead, they could stay submerged for weeks on end and they had enough energy to go 20 to 25 knots while they were down there. It's a pretty big deal. And recently, nuclear technology is advancing a little bit further into portable nuclear power plants. But let's go back into the past a little bit again in a minute, because I mentioned this earlier. Uh, we do put nuclear stuff into space. Voyager 1 and 2 both run on nuclear power. Mars Science Lab's Curiosity runs on nuclear power. Even the Cassini and New Horizons probes run on nuclear power. Over 40 different spacecraft have flown with a nuclear-powered battery on them. And it's not fission. It's based on radioactive decay. They run on something called an RTG, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. The Voyagers had a set of them. Uh, Mars Science Lab's Curiosity has a little one. And this sucker is nuclear. Again, though, not fissile. RTGs work by harvesting the heat from radioactive decay of an element. In this case, let's look at plutonium. So they turn plutonium's decay into electricity. To get the plutonium into the RTG, by the way, you have to go to the Department of Energy. Department of Energy, big deal. They have to fill the RTGs at the Department of Energy, and then once they're filled, they are sealed forever. You can't open them up and you know fix things because it's now radioactive. The DOE, is a big deal, which is why it's usually run by physicists and nuclear experts. Big deal. Anyway, I'll just let that lie. The Voyagers are using three plutonium-238 RTGs. That gave them 470 watts at launch. New Horizons uses one that has a 300 watt RTG. As the plutonium naturally decays, inside of the RTG are two metals that end up at different temperatures thanks to the radioactive decay heat. Once they're at different temperatures, electrons move between them, generating electricity that can be used to power the spacecraft. The problem is they decay and over time become less and less hot, thus less and less useful. The half-life of plutonium is 87.7 years. Voyager was launched in 1977. Now it's dropped from the 470 watts 
from when it was filled to closer to 300 watts. Nuclear is gonna change the future. It's already changed the past, which means it's changed the present. It's gonna change the future as well. We just have to figure out how to make it safe. I think if you take one thing away from this series of episodes, it's that fission is useful. It will help us get to fusion and fusion will take us the rest of the way. If we can get fusion, we will have unlimited simple energy. We will be using the same energy source that the sun is using. And mostly in these episodes, we've talked about fission because it's the one we're doing the most. It's the one that I think people don't necessarily always grasp as simply. The future is not fission though, it is fusion. And again, we talked about NIF. NIF, the National Ignition Facility, uses over 190 lasers to shoot all of this energy right at this tiny little centimeter target so that they can fuse the two little hydrogens or deuteriums, really heavy hydrogens, together and make energy. And they get energy, but they don't get more energy than they're putting in yet. You need a sustained reaction for that. I found this crazy story about fusion that I wanna share with you before we go. When you make fusion, you take two hydrogens and you smush them together to get helium. But if you put helium into a solid, like you force it together and you start making lots of helium, what happens is, is it creates little bubbles. Think of it like a soda or you know, like a bubbly water. The helium will effervesce sort of inside of the solid. And because of that, it can create little pockets which destroys the stuff that you're trying to fuse together. And it's something that they're trying to overcome in fusion right now. But if you use nanocomposites, which are layers of metals, like nanoscale layers, like sandwiches, like those waffle or wafer cookies that you would eat, um, those nanometer scales cause something crazy to happen. I'm just gonna quote the lead researcher, Dr. Demkowitz. He says, quote, we were blown away by what we saw when we did this. So what happens is, when you fuse the two hydrogens, you still get helium. The helium still creates little pockets and those little pockets link up. But instead of destroying the material, they link into tunnels that start to resemble a vascular system. They sort of look like veins and the channels link up until they can find a place to exit and get the helium out of there. Isn't that awesome? Fusion is gonna be so cool. And they think they can use this vascular system to create what they call vascularized solids, which will help transport heat and electricity and potentially even chemicals throughout a solid material, which is so cool. Fusion is the future, fission is the now. Nuclear science is incredible stuff. It's the bleeding edge of engineering, science, technology, and math. They have to have picosecond calculated clocks to make some of this stuff work. But it's also history. It's also in the past. It's been around for almost 100 years. We live in the atomic age, but we could get more atomic. We could get more better. What do you guys think? Before you go, I want you to check out Bad Science. It's a new podcast from Seeker. It's a funny podcast. I'm not super funny, but they are super funny. And they always have a scientist and a comedian and they come on to talk about your favorite movies and the science in them. So good, it's awesome, go subscribe. They also have a Back to the Future episode I am particularly fond of. And one more thing, we did do a Star Trek 2009 episode where we talked to people from the Lawrence Livermore Lab, from the National Ignition Facility about fusion. It's awesome, you should check that one out on Bad Science as well. Hey everyone, before you go, I'd like to take one second and thank Domain.com for sponsoring this episode of Seeker Plus. Domain.com is awesome, affordable, and reliable. They have all the tools that you need to build your new website and they can fulfill all your website needs. They offer .com and .net domain names, they have intuitive website builders, and they have over 300 domain extensions to fit your needs, from .club to .space to .store to .dog, .pizza, you name it. Take that first step in creating an identity online and visit domain.com. Thanks everyone, for more Seeker Plus, please subscribe, and if you like science, you should definitely also subscribe. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram and everywhere. You can also find me out there. I'm on all the platforms, at Trace Dominguez. One last thing, we are doing fusion now, and the NIF output is still heating a turbine. That's the job. It's just heating water that then turns a turbine. Isn't that crazy? I love that. Thanks for watching.